Now we're going to start talking in, uh, in depth about molecules and particularly biomolecules. Um, before we do, I need to run you through a little bit about chemistry. Um, you're in 151 now, so uh, it's possible that you've already had chemistry. It's a good idea if you have had chemistry before you take 151. You definitely need to take it before you take micro, if you need to take micro as your prerequisite. So let's just go over some of the basics. First of all, we're, when we talk about a molecular formula, we're, we're representing on a piece of paper something about that molecule. And I'm going to continue to encourage you to think about molecules as tangible three-dimensional things. They're way too small to be seen with a microscope. We're never going to actually see one. But Molecules are three-dimensional, they have shape, and they're real things. They're not just concepts, right? So one of the things we can do is we can give a molecule a name, like glucose. Glucose is the name of a specific molecule. If I wanted to tell you more about glucose, I could give you like a basic recipe. This is the basic recipe for making glucose. The basic recipe is I'm going to need six carbons of six atoms of carbon. I'm going to need 12 atoms of hydrogen, and I'm going to need six atoms of oxygen. That is my basic formula for glucose. Now, actually, that doesn't say enough because there are many different um, sugar molecules other than glucose that have that same recipe. Even though they've got the same basic ingredients, those molecules are put together in a different structure, so they are different. But this tells me more about the molecule than the word glucose does. For one thing, it tells me I've got the same number of carbons as I have oxygens and twice as many hydrogens as either of them. And so I'm probably dealing with a carbohydrate. I would know that even without knowing anything more about, about the shape of the molecule. Um, let's talk about water. Water is called H2O. We all know water is called H2O. And it's because every water molecule has got two hydrogens and one oxygen. One thing you need to remember is the names of all of the abbreviations, right? You need to know that C stands for carbon, H stands for hydrogen, O stands for oxygen, right? There were 12 that I asked you to memorize. And then you also need to remember that this number here is referring to the hydrogen in front of it, not the oxygen after it. Hmm. Now, we do have ways on paper or in a textbook to represent molecules in more detail. So I can tell the difference between a glucose molecule and, I don't know, maltose, uh, by looking at it on paper as well. And we do that with structural formulas. Structural formulas, we will use lines, sometimes fancy looking lines, to illustrate covalent bonds. A single line, like we have here, that is a single covalent bond. Those two hydrogens are sharing one pair of electrons. Here we've got a double line. Well, that's a double covalent bond. That means these two oxygen atoms are sharing two pairs of electrons, a double covalent bond. When we're depicting water here, you can see that we've actually got a little angle. So we're showing that that is a polar covalent bond. And here we've got CO2. You can see the oxygens are attached to the carbon by double nonpolar covalent bonds. So that's a three-dimensional structure. Now, we actually can go even farther and we can actually model the molecule in three dimensions. Um, these three-dimensional models, they can be simple like this, that um, are almost like, you know, you put took styrofoam balls and, and stuck them together. But it does show you that there is a real three-dimensional tangible structure to this particular molecule. So keep thinking about that. We're gonna start talking about biomolecules and biomolecules are all based on carbon. The element carbon is exceptional. One of the things biologists like to do, we like to think about 
how in the world could something as complicated as life just pop up on a planet? We like to think about that. Um, and we also like to think, okay, if we go to another planet and there is a form of life on that other planet, how would we recognize it? Like, and I'm thinking, we're, when we're thinking about that, we're not thinking about monkeys, okay? If you've got a monkey running around there, even if it's a five-armed monkey or something like that, you're going to recognize that as being alive. We're talking about how would we know if something is alive? Like, like if aliens came to a planet that had nothing but bacteria on it, the bacteria, a lot of them don't even move, really. How would they know they were alive? And when we think about that, we think about all kinds of theories. Well, one of the things that scientists keep coming back to is that we believe that the only basis for the only element that you can base life on is carbon. Um, carbon is exceptional because it has got four electrons in its outer electron shell and it has four vacancies, right? Now, honestly, silicon also has got four electrons in its outer electron shell and four vacancies. So you might say, whoa, why is carbon so special? Well, uh, carbon has the four electrons and the four vacancies at the second electron shell, which is close to the nucleus, close to the protons. Silicon, those vacancies are at the third electron shell. And since it's at the third electron shell, the covalent bonds that are made between silicon and oxygen or hydrogen are not very strong. So when it comes to forming covalent bonds, carbon is the only element, the only kind of atom that can form four, co po four covalent bonds that are super strong because they're here at the second electron shell, right? So carbon is exceptional. Oh, by the way, why four electron covalent bonds? Why is that exceptional? Uh, I want you to imagine that covalent bonds would be like, like sticks, okay? They're, they're gonna be our covalent bonds and that all the different atoms that are found in the universe are like little balls of wood. If that ball, if that ball of wood is like a hydrogen, it would have a single hole in it, which means you could take the hydrogen, put a stick in it, attach another hydrogen, and that's all that you could build. If the world was filled with hydrogens that can form a single covalent bond, you could be a world, build a world filled with little dumbbell molecules. That's not going to create something as complicated as life. Um, oxygen and nitrogen would be, oxygen would have two holes in it. So if the world was filled with oxygen type atoms, you could build really long sticks. Still can't make something as complicated as life. Carbon would be like a ball with one, two, three, four different holes in it. So you can use the, it to make very complicated three-dimensional structures like you. Okay. So organic molecules. When we describe a molecule as organic, we, we don't mean it in the sense of like organic food, okay? Uh, when we talk about organic foods, we talk about foods that are made without pesticides or whatever in the process. That, that's not what we're talking about. Organic molecules are molecules that are based on carbon, okay? So uh, organic chemistry is this whole branch of chemistry. When you take chemistry, like let's say you're uh, going to go to PA school, you'll take a year of general chemistry, that's all the other kind of chemistry, and then you take a year of organic chemistry. And organic chemistry is all of the molecules that are built starting with carbon, with oxygen and hydrogen usually bound to it. So organic molecules make life possible. Carbon is necessary, we believe, for life in the universe. And um, carbon-based molecules that are made by life are often known as biomolecules. Biomolecules, the molecules of life. And biomolecules are all organic molecules. Now, there are four kinds of organic molecules, and we're going to talk about them. And we're going to start 
by talking about carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are the simplest of the biomolecules. Uh, then we will talk about lipids. Lipids are also known as fats. Um, and after that, we will talk about proteins. And finally, we will talk about nucleic acids. You may notice that this list is kind of similar to the list on any package of food that you might purchase. Um, when you talk, when you get a package of food, it'll say that it's got this many carbohydrates, this much fat, and this much protein in the food, right? Um, so it's true that the food that we eat is made out of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. There's also nucleic acids in them. It's just not the law that it has to be uh, labeled on the package. Um, but the reason that's in our food is because life is made out of those, which means you are made out of those. We're gonna start with talking about carbohydrates. So a little bit more about how scientists represent molecules. We've already talked about simple ways of representing molecules. I told you, you could have the word for the molecule, which is glucose. You can have its molecular formula, but more than that, we can represent them structurally. Um, here is what a molecule of glucose looks like if you represent it structurally. You can see it's got a carbon there, a single covalent bond, a carbon, a single covalent bond, a carbon, right? We've got a covalent bond to a hydrogen there, a covalent bond to an oxygen there, that oxygen is bound to the hydrogen by a covalent bond, but that is shorthanded. We don't give it an extra line um, in that case. So this is another way, but uh, certainly there must have been some grad students somewhere that got tired of writing out all of those individual atoms and said, can't we just shorthand it? And this is the standard shorthand where when there is a, uh, a carbon at um, the joining of two covalent bonds, you don't even write the letter C because you just assume that's where a carbon is going to be. And if there is a, hot, a covalent bond and it's empty at the end, then you can assume there's a hydrogen hanging out there, right? So these are different ways. Now, I'm telling you this because you will see this on exam one and you need to know what you're looking at. And also because these next slides um, rely on you understanding what you're looking at. The next thing before we actually talk about carbohydrates, I need to explain to you the difference between a monomer and a polymer. Out of the uh, bonds that we're, uh, sorry, out of the biomolecules we're looking at, there are three of them that are properly considered polymers. Uh, complex carbohydrates are considered polymers, proteins are considered polymers, and nucleic acids are considered polymers, right? What do we mean? Polymers are large molecules that are made of many smaller molecules, and a small molecule that gets put together to make a larger molecule gets called a monomer. So let's look at glucose. I've been talking about glucose in the last video and this one. These are a whole bunch of glucose molecules. You'll notice that every glucose molecule looks like a little ring when you put it into water, a single, in the case of glucose, six-sided ring. But if I wanted to build a complex carbohydrate like glycogen or like starch, it would be many individual glucose molecules put together, right? So there's a glucose, there's a glucose, there's a glucose, there's a glucose put together. So the, the little building block molecules are called monomers and what you build from them is the polymer, right? We will start there at the beginning of the next video.